Well, hello and uh, welcome to this monthly analyst debates webinar between me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Canada who's joining us from Toronto. And um, just quickly get the disclaimer out of the way. I have to do that for compliance and uh, regulatory purposes. But once, once we get that out of the way and we can digest all of the various risk warnings and what have you, we can basically get cracking on um, on this webinar and um, have a look at um, the reasons why we're suddenly deciding to see this massive correction, well not massive, this significant correction, it's all relative, this significant correction in equity markets that we've seen over the past two or three days. And, you know, and I think what we need to do, while Colin's still trying to sort himself out, I'll sort of ramble on a little bit. Um, but we've got a whole host of charts that we want to show you, um, basically looking at U.S. markets, the Russell 2000 or the small cap 2000 as we call it. Also look at some of the European markets, the Euro 50, which is in front of you right now, which is the Euro stocks 50, and which has broken a very key long-term uptrend line from lows that we saw in 2013. I can just zoom the chart out there. And um, look at um, some key support levels, not only on this particular chart, but also um, have a look at the FTSE 100, UK 100, the, the S&P, um, the Dow, and really, I think, establish whether or not <coughs> this is going to be the beginning of a significant correction or whether this is just one of many dips that we've seen over the course of the last two to three years. I certainly think that um, you know there is there is there's been an expectation that we haven't had a correction for such a long time, and really what's but what's going to what's the catalyst going to be for a correction? And um, again, last week we saw a really good payrolls number out of the U.S. Really good. I mean, 280,000, not only on the non-farms but also on the ADP. But overall, you know, I've had significant misgivings about the fact that you know markets are looking at what I would call, I don't know it's an overused cliche, the Goldilocks scenario, but you know, how, how much higher can these markets go against the background of a retreating Fed and the fact that in January, at the beginning of this year, we were looking at potential growth in the first quarter for the US economy of 1.1%, and in the space of six weeks, that growth target went from plus 1.1% to minus 29 and yet we're seeing a bounce back in jobs growth in the U.S. A good part of those jobs are part-time, but all of the other, all of the other, um, all of the other um, indicators that we've been seeing so far, durable goods, retail sales, and, o and other data, haven't really sort of been impressing. You know, and I think that for me, I think is is, is the main concern. Anyway, I mean, I know Colin wanted to talk to you about a number of different charts. I don't know whether he can see my desktop now. I mean, I'm hoping that he can. Um, can you see it? Can you see it, Colin? I can, Michael. I, um, I'm logged in as a participant, so I can't uh, okay. control it, but I can, uh, I can, can see, see everything. It. Could you now please you, put up... You, Sorry, wanted to start, you, started, you wanted to start with the US small cap 2000, didn't you? So yes, please. I will show you that chart, which this is, is a, a daily uh, chart. A very significant chart. And... That's excellent. Okay, so this is a daily chart. It's over the course of the last 12 months, and um, what, it, what it's showing you is the is is basically the performance over the course since November. And to me, that looks like a little bit like a potential double top if we actually blow it out from there. Absolutely, it looks like an absolutely huge double top here. And uh, and if we're looking on a weekly look at this down candle we've got, and we're breaking. A, uh, a shorter term here. trend support line. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's important here is I was looking overnight and we saw the, the, the Dow down about half a percent, and, but the, but the, the uh, Russell down 2%. It's, it's a huge decline. The, uh, the small cap stocks have fallen out of bed. And, and this is, it, it suggests that we, we started to see a sell off this week. Well, this has shown a major increase in breadth in selling. Maybe the more limited, uh, the small, only 
30 stocks in the Dow rallied up to touch 17,000. But look at this. We're seeing this is suggesting broad-based selling uh, in the U.S. market. And, and there's something significant to uh, to note here, which is, number one, you're seeing a, a huge double top. So technically, this is looking very vulnerable here. When we went back to the short-term charts, uh, could you just put up the uh, – go back to a daily chart for a second, Michael? Well, I can indeed. Something else we're looking at here, if you look at the stochastics, we had a, a very over, an overbought stochastics, and the RSI looked quite similar. We're now seeing a major roll down in the momentum indicators, not just the stochastics, also the RSI. Both of them have broken the 50 line today. And, uh, and if we look at the RSIs across the U.S. indices, whether it's the Dow, the, the S&P 500, and the Russell, they've all gone under 50 today. That shows a, a serious downturn in momentum in U.S. markets. It looks like we're heading into a uh, into a fairly significant correction, and, and what's important here on a, on a seasonal basis is that historically May and June you often see a correction, get a rebound into earnings season in July, and then uh, beginning of August through to the middle of October are the weakest time of the year historically for stock markets. And we're heading into a point where we didn't get a correction in May and June because we had this continued uh, inflow of liquidity, uh, not just from the Fed, but also uh, the prospects for, for money in the future from the ECB, but not now, just money later. And uh, and, and now we're starting to see indices roll over. And, and what's important here is that we, if you look at the action from this week, could we put the uh, the U.S. 30 on a uh, on a 15-minute chart, please, Michael? We can indeed. And uh, maybe we could take that out to max, say, about four or five days. I just want to highlight that there's been a lot of talk lately about about complacency in the in the stock market, and and things had been fairly quiet even even through the end of June. But in the last few days, we're starting to see uh, intraday volatility pick up. We're starting to we see we look at uh, at Monday things were fairly quiet and then a big drop. And yesterday we had a bit of a, a small rebound and then a bigger rebound later, and that wasn't able to hold. And overnight we had the markets going down. So we're, we're starting to see markets going back and forth, more of a battle between the bull and the bears. The bulls aren't in complete control of the market anymore. Their hold is slipping. The bears are starting to get control, but they don't have they haven't been able to fully take over either. We're starting to see more trading opportunities increase. And uh, and, and more significantly, yes, we did get a positive response to Alcoa's earnings beat, but if uh, with the way that inflate uh, that valuations have uh, have expanded, any kind of disappointment you could just as easily see an individual stock get, get soundly hammered o over the next few weeks. We've got a lot of earnings reports coming out, so there's a potential for a, a number of, of swings and moves as as, as traders try to to. Uh, get a feeling for, are the earnings now enough to justify the price? If you think about the P.E. ratio, the price has gone way up. Now the earnings need to go up to justify the price, and if they don't, markets look really vulnerable. And even if they do, do earnings go up enough to justify the increase in valuations? So it looks like we could be heading into a correction. The other thing I wanted to mention was the, the Fed minutes yesterday. Yes, you had a, a rally on, on the fact that the Fed said they're not going to shrink their balance sheet before they uh, start raising interest rates. They're going to either do it at the same time or after they start raising interest rates. So a few people jumped on that as a positive. But the one they completely missed was that the, uh, the Fed also said they plan on wrapping up their tapering program in, at the end of Oct in October. Originally, most people had figured that they would spread out the, the last $15 billion over the October and December meetings. Now it's October. They're going to do it all. So they're actually moving up the end of tapering. The last time the, uh, the U.S. had a... Um, the last two QE programs, QE1 and 2, within three months of the end of it, the U.S. markets fell by 15%. That's the, the overinflation from the easy money that, that inflates stock prices coming back out. So you're at a risk that you could have a fairly – we didn't get that this time around. With, uh, with QE3, they've done this tapering thing, which has just helped to support the stock markets, yet – we're now heading toward the, a serious hard end, hard end to QE3, and that suggests at some point you could be heading for a significant correction because you haven't had one yet. Instead of during tapering markets going sideways or down, they've, they've continued to go up. Uh, stocks have continued to be inflated by the money coming in, and at some point with the Fed starts to, when the Fed starts to take away the punch bowl, the, uh, the markets could be in fairly significant trouble. Uh, as we're seeing volatility increase, we are starting to see people also look back to havens. Can we bring up the, uh, the gold chart, please, Michael? We can indeed. 
It's interesting that S&P chart bouncing off that support line, but we'll look at that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So let's look at gold. Quite a few lines on there, but um, overall we can see that... Um, is that the one you want, the daily chart? That's what That's I've perfect. got at the moment. That's absolutely perfect. So what I wanted to talk about here is the uh, the gold chart, and uh, in particular, we have a huge breakout in gold today. So gold had been in a downtrend for quite a while. It's been trying to base build over, say, the last six to nine months, and uh, and it started to work its way higher. In uh, in June, we had an initial rally when uh, when the ECB started to talk about uh, bringing a, bringing back the uh, the LTROs, which are coming this fall. Gold over the last historically used to trade against the U.S. dollar as as gold being the, the, the leading hard asset and the U.S. dollar being the leading paper currency. Now, what's happened in the last five years is that instead of trading against the U.S. dollar, gold has been trading against the euro. So as the European money supply went up, gold went gold went up as the as the european money supply went down over the last uh, 18 months gold went down now the europeans are talking about putting more money back into the system gold's been going back up again so that's that's one thing you've got uh, uh potentially pushing gold higher you're starting to see uh, increases in commodity prices again although crude oil is coming back off but uh, but copper is starting to build if you do see inflation pressures start to come in as, as we've seen the uh, uh inflation in the u.s coming back up towards two percent that's potentially bullish for gold. Gold is historically a long-term inflation hedge. Plus, if we start to see the uh, uh, corrections in, in the stock market and, uh, and increased volatility and increased uncertainty and risk, whether it's in, in Europe in the, in the banking system or the economy or, or in the U.S. with the, uh, what's going to happen to stocks when the, when the Fed starts normalizing uh, monetary policy and raising interest rates, uh, things are starting to come around again and it looks like uh, are starting to come around and, and the prospects are looking brighter for gold here so uh, what's encouraging you had a big spike up rally initial uh, initial in uh, in june where you broke out of a three-month downtrend you've consolidated here uh, uh just above the uh, the 1300 dollars level very well bid very well supported through a three-week consolidation now it's starting to go up again this is a classic staircase pattern rally consolidated higher levels and break out again so uh, looking at some pretty solid accumulation for gold and uh, and uh, the prospects for gold are looking for pretty positive through the rest of the year so you would think that if we see a say a pullback, um, we'd probably find support around about one thousand three hundred and twenty dollars an ounce, or maybe a little bit above that or below that. Uh, it looks right around there, right around that breakout point where you have the line drawn. This one here, or the one the just upper above one, it? yes. Upper so that one. would be your first line of support, and then and then the second one here at. Uh, Oh, that's better. So your first line of support would be here around what 1330, and then your second line of support down here around 1310, where you yeah. had those last few tails of the candles uh, bottoming out. 1300 to say 1308 to 1310, where those tails were. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things about candles, uh, ladies and gentlemen. When you have very long tails, either on the top side or the downside, and they they occur at fairly regular intervals, that generally suggests that. The market, even though it's trying to push it lower and it's not able, and it closes near the highs or near near where it opens, that normally suggests that um, the market's getting a little bit short. And, and you know, long long tails on the downside suggests that um, there's not really any appetite to push it lower because every time the market tries to push lower, it actually closes pretty much where it opens. And we can see that from here. We've got one, two, three, four. Um, four attempts, the market's gone down, but it's actually not been able to follow through on any occasion that it's tried to move lower. Um, now it's broken higher. Um, it's, likely to, it's likely to be the case that we'll find support between 13.25 and 13.30. Um, it's a little bit disappointing we haven't closed above 13.40, but overall, if what Colin's saying is right, and you know that there is a distinct, there is a distinct possibility that he is. Given the, given what's happening with U.S. inflation, the Fed say they're not concerned about it, but I certainly think there is um, some inflation building up in the U.S. economy. It's certainly borne out in the CPI numbers, and it's certainly being borne out in the PCE numbers, which 
um, you know, a closing in or around and moving above the 2% level. So 1340, we really need to move beyond that. But even if we do, we're going to run into this resistance line from the August highs last year, which currently comes in around about the 1360 area. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on that. Now, obviously, we've seen a significant uh, decline in stock markets over the course of the last week or so, despite those very, very good payrolls numbers. I think Christine Lagarde's comments at the weekend, and I tend to, I tend to take with a little bit of a pinch of salt um, what the IMF say with respect to growth forecasts, but I certainly think on this occasion she probably does have a point. I think expectations for growth and um, economic growth over the course of the next six months are probably slightly inflated. If that is the case, then certainly valuations probably are a little bit stretched at these levels and we are due a correction. Now, we've got the S&P. The S&P has been pretty much one of the massive outperformers when it comes to U.S. stock markets. It's made new all-time highs on a fairly regular basis throughout June and July. The key support level for, here, for me, we've tested it today. It's round about 1950, 1950. But ideally, what I'd like to see it do is take out these twin lows through here uh, around about uh, 1945, 1945 through there. If we can get through there, then I certainly think there's a potential for a significant correction lower. And that's certainly worth something keeping an eye on. And it does sort of tie in with the small cap. Um, Could I just add something to that before we move sure. on, Michael? Uh, if we take a look at the stochastics, between May and, and July, you've got a head and shoulders top forming in the stochastics. You've got that first overbought range back at the beginning of May. As a left shoulder, you've got a head with this huge overbought uh, situation here at the beginning of June, and you've got a, a right shoulder here at, uh, and a rising neckline on top of it, which Michael has just drawn in, and it looks like you're starting to break that and uh, as you roll back down from overbought. So the rolling back down from overbought is a, uh, is a bearish technical signal. The head and shoulders top, you can get head and shoulders patterns in stochastics in RSI and MACD. They're very rare, but when they show up, they're very powerful, and it's really important for traders to pay attention to them because they're a signal of a, uh, of a pretty significant change in momentum. But they also do need to be confirmed by the price action. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, we, 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 we've talked about this, this support line here. Let's also look at the Euro stocks 50 because that's actually broken a very key support line today. And again, there's a potential reversal pattern forming here on the daily charts. Now, there is a slight. There is this neckline here is not ideal because for me it's sloping the wrong way. But it does seem to, to suggest that we are forming a potential top here, but what we need to do with respect to this is take out the May lows, the twin May lows through here, around about 3,125. Now, at the moment, we've seen a strong move lower. Let's zoom that out, and we can see that the June lows last year were significant in, in the context of this particular up move. Now, what we're looking to see is whether or not we can break down through this support line and test the 200-day moving average. Now, let's also look and test um, whether or not the um, slow stochastic is showing the similar sort of divergence that we saw on the S&P. And I would hazard a guess it probably is to a certain extent, but probably not to the same extent. And um, certainly in the context of the rally that we saw um, last week with respect to U.S. markets, I think it was very, very significant that even though U.S. markets made new all-time highs, the DAX didn't, the Euro 50 didn't, and um, the Euro 50 wouldn't have, have anyway because it's, it's not recovered its 2006-2007 highs, but it didn't make fresh highs from the June highs, and that for me I think was was very significant in the context of the risk trade. You know, so why, why, have, why have we started to roll over today of all days? I think there's a number of reasons for that. I think if you look at what bond yields have done over the course of the last few months, specifically in Spain, Italy, Greece, and Portugal, they've hit all-time lows. They've hit their lowest levels even since before the financial crisis. Now, I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but if anyone is suggesting to me that Portugal, Greece, Spain, and Italy are now more creditworthy than they were before the financial crisis, then really um, 
they, someone must be living in an alternative reality because the fact that Spanish bond yields, 10-year bond yields, were trading below U.S. bond yields um, really doesn't come across as economically sound. But there, I think there's one reason behind that, and I think that's why there's been an awful lot of concern about this Portuguese bank, Espiritu Santo, and the solvency issues. A lot of the reason why these bond yields have fallen so low is because essentially people have been playing the carry trade. They've been looking for yield. So they've been putting, a lot of these European banks have been basically putting their money into sovereign bonds. Sovereign bonds at yields that are yielding 3, 4, 5 percent in an environment in Europe which is potentially disinflationary if not deflationary. And that in itself and the fact that Espiritu Santo may go bust then shines a light on the rest of the European banking sector, namely Portuguese, Spanish and Italian banks and their solvency. And given the fact that there are concerns about solvency, anyone who has money in sovereign bonds is going to rotate the money out, which is why we've seen Portuguese bond yields spike today. They've gone up 13 basis points. Spanish bond yields have gone up two or three basis points. And I think that's why you're seeing a sell-off, particularly in the financials, um, you know, the Spanish banks, the Italian banks, um, and the Portuguese banks. Um, so that's why you're seeing sell-off in the financials, because of the contagion risk, if you like. I know it's a very old phrase, but it's still as relevant now as it was two or three years ago when people were worried about the euro breaking apart. So for me, this, this is a lot of what's behind this particular sell-off. So if this Portuguese bank gets bailed out, or it's, it manages to assuage investor concerns, we could get a rebound in stock markets. However, when you've got the ECB looking at banks' balance sheets between now and the end of September and looking to stress test them and looking to stress test their sovereign bond holdings as well, then I think it's reasonable to assume that it's going to be, uh, I think investors are going to be very, very careful about where they put their money going forward, which I think means that you could see a little bit of leakage out of Portuguese, Spanish, um, Greek and Italian um, banking stocks, as well as see yields start to edge higher. And that is probably going to have a negative effect on Spanish, it Italian and Portuguese stock markets who have and which have outperformed since the beginning of 2014. And I think that's also why you're seeing German bond yields hit their lowest levels since 2013. And we can see that borne out by this particular chart here. Now, this is, this is the wrong one. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the DAX. I should be looking at the Euro Bund. Here it is. Now, we all know prices move inversely to yields. So we can see here, look at the Bund trading almost at 149. And if we now go out to one week, we can see that it's more or less back at the levels we saw in 2013 and 2012. If anything, it's slightly above there. But that suggests to me that there, people are, investors are putting their money in German bonds. They're putting them in UK gilts. They're putting them in US treasuries, which is why we've also seen today US bond yields start to edge lower and treasury prices start edging higher again. You can see this is a one-day chart for the US 10-year note, and we can see straight away prices are moving higher, yields are moving down. And that's why the dollar is actually um, as weak as it is against the yen, because it's very, very susceptible, the dollar yen, to what US yields do. So when the price moves up, the yields move down, that depresses and pushes dollar yen down. And over the past four days, we've gone from around about 2.65% to pretty much where we are now, which I think is around about 2.54, 2.55. I'll have to check my Bloomberg just to make sure that is doubly accurate, and then I can drag that over and we can see that here. Yep, 2.5%. If I just pull my Bloomberg over, we can see that there. 2.5% drop in yields, rise in prices. So at the moment, it ties in, gold higher, US Treasuries up, yields down. What you're seeing is a classic risk-off trade going on right now. Um, I, would ha I would say, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to fire questions our, ways, our way, even. That's why we're here. We want your feedback. We want uh, 
if you want us to look at a particular market you have a particular interest in, you know, basically please feel free to use the chat facility and let us know that way. And a couple of other significant trading opportunities I'd like to share with you. I'm going to move on to currencies now unless you want to expand upon anything that I've just been talking about, Colin. Uh, I just wanted to wonder, if you, could you bring up the chart for the DAX for one second? Yeah, sure. So we talked well. about uh, about topping patterns in the uh, in the U.S. market, and, and we're also seeing it in in Europe as well. Look at this uh, uh, chart here in the DAX. I mean, this is a classic triple top over the last uh, four or five weeks, and on top of that, not only you have this triple top coming in at a huge psychological barrier, this big 10,000 round number here. You tried three times to get through it. You couldn't hold it. You've actually there's an uptrend here that's actually been broken. You're starting to roll over on the DAX. It's not just the U.S. markets. You're heading into what could be a fairly significant correction uh, for markets around the world, and that, that's important, too. Again, I talked about the uh, the Russell and breadth. If you start to see more countries and more indices rolling over, is, is indicative that we're, we're heading into what looks to be a long overdue correction. Let me just redraw that line. I just missed that slightly. So there's a nice little line coming in there yeah. through those lows in March and April. Um, it's probably probably not going to. It actually might extend back to there, which the black line underneath is the 200-day moving average. So again, you know we can see from this particular chart the overall uptrend 200-day moving average is generally a good a good benchmark for overall trends up or down. So I certainly think in the context of the DAX, now that we've broken below um, this 9,790 level quite significantly by the looks of it, what we really need to see now is for the market to get back above it because we can see from here that it's actually just support on a fairly regular basis. Okay, it's a bit messy around here, but certainly since May, it's acted as a good support level. We've now broken below it. It acted as resistance yesterday and today, and there's a good chance we could actually test this lower line here from the lows in March and April. May get a little bit of buying interest, a brief rebound, but until such times as we get back above <coughs> 9,800, then I think there's a good chance that we could go and push lower towards that 200-day moving average. And that certainly seems to be the case with respect to the FTSE 100 as well, if we look at this chart, um, we've, we've again tested a key trend line support level. Um, this particular line I drew earlier today, it's on the chart forums if you want to have a look at it. Um, on the right hand side, if there's a little bubble um, where you can basically click on the chart and you can look at the analysis that I've drawn in. But if I zoom this out from the lows that we saw last year, we've tested trend line support there on the FTSE 100. We are trading below the 200-day moving average, but we've done that on a number of occasions over the course of the last 12 months before breaking back above it. For me, I think what's more significant is this particular trend line here. We've got one, two, three, four. This is the fifth touch. If we break below it, then I think if we break it out and blow it out even further, this is the big, big long-term trend line here from 2011. That, that comes in around about 6,500. So if we break below there, then we could then in turn um, push even lower towards that overall trend line there. And when you actually look at the gains that we've seen over the course of the last two to three years, the correction that we're seeing at the moment isn't you know, that significant. What's significant is I think we've seen breakouts not only on the FTSE 100, but we've seen them on the DAX. And if we also see them on the S&P, and the small caps, the U.S. small caps in particular, then we could well see um, a ripple through effect on other related equity markets as well. And just to reinforce that point, we looked at the Euro 50 earlier. Again, look, that's the key support level for me, 3,129. Um, moving could you on show, to, go on. I'm sorry, could you show the, I wanted to go back to one more thing on the DAX, please, and then we'll sure. move on. Um, something to note when we're using momentum indicators is uh, it's important also not just to look at things on, on where, are they overbought or oversold or what line are they crossing, but kind of what's the trend? And actually, could you go back to longer term, Michael? 
Thanks. I wanted to note something here with the stochastics. When you've been in a long-term uptrend with the DAX, and what do you keep seeing in this in here? Every time you hit a peak, pushes way up into overbought, way up into overbought. Every every month or so, every every significant top, you're seeing the stochastics consistently going up above 80 percent. And what are we seeing all of a sudden in the last two the last two peaks, peaking out at 60 rather than as, rather than 80 or more? That's indicative that your upward pulses are getting weaker. Your upward momentum momentum is getting weaker and, and technically you're looking more vulnerable here. So there's a lot of ways to look at um, momentum uh, indicators. They're very powerful tools. You look to the price action for confirmation, but that's another thing to note here. This, these lower, significantly all of a sudden lower highs the last two rounds on the, uh, on the stochastics is also uh, bearish technically. I'm sorry, Michael. Now, now we can move on to the uh, uh, currency market. <laughs> Okay, our um, half hours on well, our half hour is up. Let's look at let's look at Dollar Canada because I was looking at this the other day, and you've got your own employment report later this week. And for me, this 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 chart here is a daily chart, Dollar Canada. And again, this is something that I put on the chart forums. Now we've broken below the long-term 200-day moving average, and I think you know the Canadian employment report tomorrow could be the key catalyst as to where Dollar CAD goes next. Let's pull this out. And keep pulling it out, and let's keep pulling it out, and keep pulling it out. The 2012 lows that we saw in Dollar Canada are a significant inflection point uh, for this current move higher. Now we look as if we're going to be running into a little bit of support level. And look how many touches there are on this line. This is a weekly chart that I'm showing you here. But if I just drill it back into a daily, you know, I think it gives you an indication of how extremely important this particular line is. And look at the look at the um the sideways price action that we're getting at the moment. We've got good resistance just above or just below one oh seven. You've got that peak there, you've got that peak there. So you've got potentially a little top there. You've got a number of a number of uh support areas around about um one oh six twenty, one oh six thirty, around about there. So for me I think the key driver for Dollar Canada over the next couple of days is going to be, first and foremost, whether or not you think the US dollar is going to either significantly weaken or significantly strengthen. And certainly the, the, uh, the FOMC minutes don't really give us too much in the way of clues with respect to that. But also, how good or bad is tomorrow's Canadian employment report going to be? And given the fact that we're so very, very close to this long-term trend line, you now there's certainly a potential trading opportunity in play on that particular um, currency pair. Colin. Absolutely. It looks like we're headed for a, a very active time. We also had found, because we had a fairly sizable downdraft here in June, uh, the, this pair had gotten oversold, and a lot of what we're seeing in the in the last few weeks is the uh, basically what I call working off an oversold RSI, uh, as an example, if you want to bring or this guy, either one. And, uh, and basically what you're seeing is U.S. dollar CAD had become pretty oversold here. So it was due for a pause. We're getting a pause. But to me so far, when, it, when this pattern first started to form, I was looking at it and thinking, oh, this looks like a saucer bottom above a trend line. But in fact, as, as it started to continue to play out, it really does now look, just look more like a sidewise uh, rectangle co consolidation, uh, basically working off this oversold condition, but still within a larger uptrend. If you get a, a soft report in the Canadian dollar weekend, um, the first test is, is, as Michael noted, right here around this 107. If not, you're looking at that Fibonacci level uh, a bit above it. That's closer to 108. And, uh, yeah. But if it breaks, you've got some pr pretty significant downside on, on, the, uh, on the downside going below 106. There's not really much support a little bit there around so 105.80, but really the first significant support range is back down here in this 104 to 105 channel where it had uh, had been had some congestion before. So you still have room for a, a significant uh, another down leg here in the uh, in the in the uh, market, particularly if you take out that big trend line there. And the next Fibonacci level is not till under 103, so you've got quite yeah. you've got some room to work with. Absolutely. I mean, this is, a, this is the this this line here is obviously what I've done with 2009 and the rally back. So we rallied back 50% of the 2009 to 2011 down move. Um, the 38.2 was resistance over here, 
and you can see that it also You've broken that. Is, um, well, now we've broken below that. So now the real the real acid test, I think, going forward is you know where do we go from here? Now, I mean, I could actually draw some Fibonacci retracements from there to there. I'm not going to because I'll do that on a completely separate chart. It's one of the nice little things about this. I can open a separate chart with with no lines on it at all. Go to one week. Go and zoom that out. Get rid of that moving average support and resist that moving average line. And then what we can do is by using the draw tools, look at the Fibonacci retracements and basically do this here. Okay, so we've got the 23.6. That's worked quite nicely there. But again, the 38.2 look is around 105.60. So that's all. It's 105.60, 105.80. We talked about it earlier. Um, you know, if we do break below 106, um, all that trend line support that I've drawn in, and uh, let's get rid of the 23.6. We don't need that for now. Draw in the trend line from there. Sorry, from there. There it is. You know, and I think that gives what that gives you is is quite a nice little um, look into the uh, the overall price dynamics of this particular currency pair. Uh, moving on to the pound, quickly, I did something about that earlier this week. Um, again, what we've got here is a little bit of a rectangle, as Colin highlighted earlier, only this time it's in the pound. Um, we are finding a little bit of a top at 171.80. You know, I think that for me is quite a significant level. I think if we break 17180, then there's a good chance we could go all the way to 173.30. But overall, what I'm looking for is a slow decline back to around about 170.40, and maybe even a little bit lower. Um, overall, simply because I think expectations about a rate hike in the UK are still, I think, more more suited to the downside than the upside. Um, people are speculating that we may get a rate hike this year. I'm probably in the skeptics camp where that comes in. What I'm looking at is the relationship between average earnings growth and, re and inflation. And at the moment, average earnings are lagging way behind that. And I think it's unlikely that the Bank of England will move on rates while that ratio is as wide as it is. Therefore, I think expectations of further sterling strength in the short to medium term will be probably dictated more by what the dollar does than what the pound does. Finally, finishing off with euro dollar, unless you have anything to add, Colin, we're in a range with that, and I see no reason for us to change that range. Looking again, long term trend lines, it's amazing how similar these charts are. The 2012 lows, that's basically when Mr. Draghi said he'd do whatever it takes to save the euro. Since then, we've gone slowly ratcheted higher. We're now finding up, we've got a massive support line around about 135. That, that was the B meeting. Um, in June, which um, saw us move sharply lower on the negative deposit rate and the announcements of the T LTRO. Then, of course, he said, well, actually, we're not going to do it until September, October. And we went all the way back up again before trading sideways. So at the moment, we're 135, 137. That is pretty much the range of it. And until such times as we take out that 135 low or that trend line support, on euro dollar, I don't think we're going to see much downside. I think there's more risk of upside than downside. Anything else you want to add, ask us, ladies and gentlemen? Um, if not, um, we'll leave this as it is. And in the process, what we will then do is we will post the recording on YouTube if you want to listen to any of it back. Any questions, ladies and gents? All good? Okay, well, thanks very much for attending. I'd like to thank you, and I'm sure Colin would like to thank you as well. Um, don't forget, we have a weekly webinar that we do every Monday afternoon at 12.15. If you want to sign up for that, um, you can do so from our website. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and um, hopefully join us at the same time next month for this um, once a month uh, chat between myself and Colin about what the markets are doing and what's looking and what the outlook is going forward.